presentation today. All right, well, thank you all for coming and joining to see our uh, presentation today. Uh, my name is Tovia. I am a rising junior currently living in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And um, I'm very excited to be here today to uh, do this presentation. I'll let the other presenters introduce themselves and then we'll jump right in. Hi everyone, I'm Anastasia. I'm originally from Russia, but I'm currently living in Spain. I've been living there for six years. I've been doing ME1 for the last four years of my life and it's become a huge part of my life. So I'm very excited to be presenting this to you today and trying to share my experiences together with my team. And I'll hand it over to the next presenter. Well, currently um, the next presenter is still joining, facing some technical difficulties. But while we wait for that, I'll just give you guys a brief introduction to what we're going to be doing today. So the point of this workshop is essentially to give you guys, as a group of youth wanting to make a change either in your school or in your community, a way to practically amplify that change. Because a lot of times we have an idea or we will have an initiative, but our personal work so far hasn't made so much of a difference. And sometimes it takes a larger scale and more organized approach to everything you're doing in order to actually make that impact. So now I'll hand it over to Alex and he'll introduce himself and provide us with a bit more of an introduction as we get started here. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Taehwan Alexander Kim and yeah, so Thank you, Tovia, for sharing. And my name, as I told you, I am Taiwan. And um, yeah, I'm in, I'm currently 12th grader in Tashkent International School. So I hope that things help. So activism doesn't grow on trees. Can anybody guess the meaning of this name? Anyone? I'm um, seeing none, I will just move on to it. So we chose this title because we wanted to emphasize the idea um, that activism is not something that just happens naturally without effort. As everybody knows, ap apple grow grows on tree without any help from humans, as we know. All they need is sunlight and water. However, for activism, it is not like a apple. We need to work hard to achieve these goals Nevertheless, although it is difficult, if youth, youth should act as potential leaders, um, um, so youth needs to act as a potential leaders to change your and our society of the world. It is important that they develop the ability to create activism. So today, Tovia and Anastasia and I are going to de deliver some ideas that activism that might give you some inspiration. Some of these ideas are rel relatively small and simple. A simple action can be cre to creating a after school activities such as school clubs. Of other types of activism are much more complicated and involve, involve more time and effort. A broader action that we can take is creating a non-governmental organization, NGO, that deal with the social issues in a specific region. Another example might be to create, um, to create a business that um, provides some um, product or service that is beneficial to society. We hope that these ideas, both small and big, um, will give you inspiration that um, you need to get involved and make the world a better place. Um, first, I like to focus um, sorry. Um, first, I would like to focus on the smaller and simpler form of activism to accomplish accomplish starting a um, school club or activity. Even though these ac ac actions may seem less significant than uh, some other forms of activism, they are still very useful in creating connections between individuals and groups and society that can lead to um, a, 
um, lead to a positive impact in um, society. As most of us know, after school activity is a program that students can participate in after school. Usually, um, it is not included into the, into the school curriculum. Although most students primarily think about joining existing after school activities, activist students take this one step further and create their own ESAs. At most schools, it is possible for students to create an ASA with the supervision of at least one adult, most likely your teacher for a different, different purpose, which is not included inside the normal school curriculum. Okay, so now I will deliver my personal example to show you how to um, so I will deliver my personal example to show how the activism could work. Um, the slow project that you can see on this slide is my very own personal example. Um, yeah, um, I created an ASA and hopefully um, it can demonstrate how it, how it goes for this. In my case, I was um, very interested in education and also history. These interests were what motivated me to create an ASA that helps refugees in Malaysia in terms of creating textbooks for their education. For me, it was most likely to create a history textbook. Yeah, so, um, at, but as a side note, I wanted to mention that I didn't exactly came up with the idea of this organization on my own. Instead, it, it was based on existing organization, the SLOW Project in South Korea, which stands for the Save Lives of Hilla. The SLOW project was the project that I enrolled in when I was in a previous school, but it has some different intention um, from the new SLOW project in Uzbekistan. By doing it, um, I thought it really matched my intention as I wanted to help minorities in terms of providing education. However, after transferring to my current school, the Tashkent International School in Uzbekistan, I realized that they didn't have the organization yet. In fact, it turned out that there were no slow organizations anywhere in Uzbekistan, and it seemed like the project was limited to the Korea at that time. Therefore, I decided to make a truly international organization and bring it into Uzbekistan. So, this is my um, example, and yeah. Um, the first step I, um, the first step I did was to reach out to private prior organization to ask the permission, permission, um, to um, bring in, um, sorry for the slide. Um, so. Uh, the first step that I was I did was to reach out to the prior organization to ask permission to um, bring this um, project into my current school. They were excited about the idea and encouraged me. After getting their support, as the mission of SLOW is to create textbook written in English for refugees, um, I, I reached out to my English teacher for his supervision. He was very glad that he could also take part in this and that made me able to create the slow project in our school. The next step was to recruit more members. So I sent out an email to my entire school explaining the project and encouraging students to join. After getting some members to my slow project, I also reached out to the UNICEF club in our school to collaborate with. As the club also has the same intention in terms of providing education and in supporting the minorities, Though these, through this effort, the slow project was able to become successful after school activity at my school. We, de we developed a um, textbook that covers diverse subjects as math, history, English, Korean language, and more. Although I started off with the history textbook mainly. In addition, we also were able to raise money and raise awareness of the project by creating a print printing canvas bag that we sold and donate, donated the funds to the school to help them buy supplies like hand sanitizer to get 
through the COVID-19 pandemic crisis as this is COVID time. Given that the project has has been so successful in helping Hale School for Refugee in Malaysia. Currently, I am trying to expand this project to help other schools in Uzbekistan, as many Uzbek schools are lacking in resources. Since Slow Project has already worked hard to develop textbook, it makes sense for us to share it with other schools that might need might need it. Not only that, I am planning to reach out to international schools in Uzbekistan to create a connection and encourage them to start slow project. ESA is at their schools too. Through the, these connections, I hope we eventually make the Uzbek society better off. Based on my ex examples of creating my own ESA, I have your recommendation that um, I would like to give you the idea how you can start um, your after school activities at your school. Um, yeah. So um, the next step after you come up with the idea for a ESA that involves your interest is to start organizing and planning. It's a good idea to recruit some friends or teammates to help you at this point, but don't worry about expanding it too much for now. Um, so when you find interest, you could just start off with some of your friends. This picture is a lacrosse picture. And um, I gave this example to show that um, when you have an interest in lacrosse, um, um, you could just directly create the ASA that is related to lacrosse. Um, in the first stage, it is good to start small so you could focus better. During this stage, you should think specific, specifically about what your group is going to be uh, like and what are they going to do, and try to connect uh, accomplishing that on a small scale rather a big scale. If something doesn't work out well at first, maybe you will need to modify your plan slightly. After getting your ASA all planned out and ready to go, the next step is to um, to get more support from the school. Um, fi find a group of people to participate and find a super supervising teacher to help make your project official. Some school might require students take trying to make a new ASA to submit an application or to get official approval from the school. So ask somebody um, the specific policies and regulations at your school in order to create the ASA successfully. Next, um, start working in your own school and organize new projects and complete them. As time passes, you could try to recruit new members, members through school and emails and more. After doing so, you could find some other ASA with similar missions to collaborate with your project. Finally, after achieving some successes in your projects and making the ASA successful at your school, you can even start branching out to other schools. Reach out to other schools that are nearby and invite them to make their own branches in your ASA. However, we need to note one thing. Before you reach out to other school and propose a collaboration, you need to have a clear and specific idea of what you want to do and how you plan to work together. Even you can contact NGOs in your region to support your project if you think they might have a similar goal or intention. These NGOs can help your ASA gain more funding and make a bigger impact on society. When you have a relatively large organization, um, communication um, communication is um, the key factor. To make communication easier, you can um, to make you can create a club's Discord room or Slack channel to communicate with other. This will help your ASA stay well connected and um, share the important points together. Communication isn't just about having the right technology to um, technically communicate. Christopher Morley an American journalist, novelist, essayist, and poet once said that there is only one rule for being a good talker, Let's learn to listen. 
I think this is really, really important point because when you when you are going to make a successful ASA, you need to listen carefully to what others are saying and work together with them, rather just asserting your own points at the time. As you can see from these suggestions, making an ASA doesn't have an incredibly complicated and difficult process. All it takes to start is a good idea, some passion and the motivation to try. Also, even though these actions tend to start off very small, they can turn out to have a large impact in the end towards the society. Thank you for listening my part of this pr presentation and next Anastasia will talk more about youth activism and scope of creating non-governmental organization, which is a slightly bigger scope compared to the creating the ASA. Thank you, Alex, for that introduction. I'll now be talking about the non-governmental organization, which, like Alex just gave an example about what he did at his school, once a project gets bigger, you might want to consider moving from an ASA to an NGO, which is a bigger scale project. And some steps you might take are to come up with an idea, to find a team, to raise awareness about your NGO, and finally to take action. So now we'll be going through each of these ideas and talking about them in detail. First is the idea. You need to find the purpose. What are you doing and why are you doing it? You have to be um, able to explain the reasoning behind your project and your philosophy because that way you'll really be sure about what you're doing and why you're doing it. You might want to even focus it around an SDG. You could pick a specific target about one of the 17 goals and this way it will be a lot more specific and you'll be able to look at for some ideas on the UN website, which is going to be very helpful. It, it just helps you center uh, around an idea and really establish the main purpose of your project. And lastly, you want to consider um, how you might want to make this happen. You want to have a long-term project, something that goes on for a long period of time, or something short, like a small event or a, couple, a series of events, but not something that lasts for years which would apply to long term. So then the next step we're going to take is we're going to talk about the team. You want to have a team when, you, when you're doing an NGO because you can't form an NGO yourself. An NGO is serious work and it's an organization and you simply cannot do that much work alone. So you have to find trustworthy people to do this with. You have to make a list of all the skills you have. For example, that could be coding, mass emailing, public speaking, and any other skill that could be applicable to your project. And then you might want to consider, well, what skills are my project, is my project missing? Maybe you're lacking a social media expert, or maybe you need someone who knows graphic design. Any skill that you think might be necessary, make a list. It'll be helpful later. Because once you look at that list, some ideas will come in mind as to who might help you. Maybe you already know someone who, want, who wants to help or who has that skill and might be able to contribute. You should then think about any other experts um, that could help you. And if you don't know someone, well, you can always do a bit of research and reach out to already existing NGOs. Uh, there are some NGOs that would be glad to help someone who's just starting out and provide some of their expertise. You also want to consider the size of the company. And in order to do that, you have to think, do you want an executive board and a leadership board? Or do you want just one? What would the size of that board be? And it all depends on what action you'll be taking, how big of an impact you will be making. You know, the, the more impact you want to have, the larger the organization has to be, simply because it will get to a point where it's too much work. I need to be able to trust these people and distribute it in a way that it's not stressful and that you're doing it um, in the best way possible. And there's actually something interesting that comes here based on what Anastasia said. And I think that it's important to note that many times you don't need to start out big. One of the main things you'll see here is that even in the way we structure this presentation, it's to show you that you don't already need to start with an NGO or a business. You can start at a smaller scale on something that you've already established and slowly build it up. And so that acts in any of the three regions. Not only can you do that with an after school activity, but within an NGO, 
You don't already have to start with a board of directors, you know, you don't already have to start with all these positions or so many faculties. It's all based on what you need. You look at the demand and you look over your experience over a couple of months and see what you need. So you have to remember to take things slowly and remember that it's progressive. You're never going to start out with everything and you build things as you go. You get new pieces to the puzzle as you learn more things and meet more people. Yeah, absolutely. And that moves me on to my last point, which is that you should choose your members based on the value. Like Tovia just said, if you have some sort of demand, you have to choose a member that will be able to meet that demand. You should not choose people based on friendship because at the end of the day, uh, it's an NGO. It addresses serious issues and it's serious work. And you might want to have someone who's taking that work seriously, not just because you're helping out a friend. Although it's important, it's um, more important to pick people based on value and merit. And that moves me on to my, uh, the next step of forming an NGO. And that is raising awareness. You want people to know about your actions. You wanna do that via social media, maybe a YouTube channel, a website. You might wanna put some posters around your city even, or you could send mass emails. Whatever way possible you wanna spread awareness about your project, because that will ensure that you will have an audience you'll be able to find funding and you have people know about your work. They want to help you and you can really get stuff done. Uh, without people knowing about what you're doing, there is no point in trying to execute a project. Um, the next step would be to actually check out laws. Um, and that is really important because it's an NGO. It's not exactly tied to a school in particular. And you might want to think about laws on a national and international level in the sense that an NGO is a legitimate organization. It requires legal work and um, preferably have a lawyer help you or at least a trustworthy adult because uh, if you don't start an NGO properly your foundation will not be right and later um, you will not be able to fully execute the project. So you want to make sure that you lay your foundation well with proper legal expertise, and then you make sure that the NGO is legitimate. And I really advise you, if you wanna start an NGO, to ask for help, especially when it comes to legal expertise, because if you're a minor, it'll be extremely difficult for you to start your own NGO. And all the ideas can be yours, and all the foundation can be based on what you believe in, but you do need an adult on the board of directors or the executive board just to help you out with legal stuff. The point which I'm gonna to touch on later is, you know, asking for that help. And I think it's again, important to note that sometimes the person that you're asking for help is you, most of the time, in fact, it's gonna be somebody close to you, somebody within your network. Um, I think it's, it's cool to see how sometimes many large businesses or really successful people, when they tell you their story, they say, you know, I had a friend that I knew that, that worked in this one business and I was interested, so I emailed him. And, and you see a lot of grassroots connections between people starting very large scale and successful initiatives. So it, the, looking out for help does not necessarily mean you have to email somebody that you don't know at all. In fact, it's going to help you more to already work with a network you've already established and already have, because in that way, it's already going to be very strengthened and personalized. Yeah, and I agree with Tovi on this completely, because it could be like Alex mentioned before for an ASA. It could be a teacher you ask with help, or it could be a parent, a grandparent. It could be really anyone that you trust and that you know knows your intentions but you want to make sure that the adult knows your intentions um, because it's a lot of work you need like legal expertise and um, you need to talk it through before really um, starting it because um, legally it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be a lengthy process in order to make your NGO credible and legitimate but um, once you get that done you can move on to the next step of forming an NGO which is taking action but what does action really mean? Anyone feel free to unmute yourself and just say what does action mean to you? Nobody knows what action means to them? 
Come on, guys. Anyone? Fun, fun driving events? Actually, okay. when you finally execute your plan, you can go out and you, uh, meet with the people you want to help. And yeah, that's what I think. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Step forward. Taking a step forward to get attention. Somebody put something in the comments. Um, implementing whatever you have learned and or want to work on in real life. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. Well, to me, action is when you make your ideas come true. And there are a couple of aspects of when you talk about action. First of all, it's dates and time because you have to have a plan. When you have an event, you need people to know about it, which is the awareness step. And when you raise awareness about an NGO and you finally establish what you want to do and you have an event plan, you have to establish those dates and times in order for people to know. There's then an audience that you're addressing. The people you reach out to are typically your audience, but also the people you're helping, they are your audience too. Um, you need to make sure that these people are aware of your intentions and that they actually show up for the event. And lastly, a huge aspect of action is funding. Where will you get your materials? This is key. No NGO can function, without proper funding. It is extremely difficult for an NGO to stand on its own without funding. And it's not salaries or anything like that, but genuinely providing people with materials, um, basic funding for events. It really does depend on the scale of your project, but you must establish this beforehand in order to finally take action. And now we'll be talking about funding in more detail. Some ideas for funding, maybe some fundraisers. They could be bake sales at your school, you could sell lottery tickets at your school and, um, or organize competitions, raffles, events, brunches. Could be really anything just to attract an audience. And this way, if you say that all the uh, proceeds go to your NGO, people are going to be more likely to help you and participate because they know it's for a good cause. You could also accept donations. You could reach out to organizations. Um, which already exist and ask them to sponsor you or be partners. Because usually um, people are more likely to become partners with you when you have a solid established plan, which we talked about beforehand. So once you present that plan to a credible NGO, they might be able to help you out with resources. Actually, they love to do that because then they have a partner. And when you develop your organization even more, you already have some connections. And lastly, you can sell products or use uh, merchandise in order to, uh, the proceeds of which will become your funding. And that will be very, very helpful for your NGO in order to finally execute action. Uh, with that being said, that is NGOs from me. And now I'll be hanging, handing it over to Tovia, who will be talking about starting your own business. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so um, this is now essentially at the top kind of, of the, the complexity uh, level. And it, it's somewhere where, you're going to really, although it seems like money and funds and other such more concrete topics are going to be the main focus, it's an area where your, your abstract intentions and, and the things going on behind the scenes are really going to have an influence on, on your success. And the, the, the topic I'm going to take here has more to do with the business, obviously, with more of a social cause um, at its heart. So, uh, for example, a business selling things at a lower price or producing things in a neighborhood where there once was no such product. Um, uh, so in that way, I think I'll have some very specific points that can guide you in very practical ways, but also some more abstract and general points that you'll be able to apply in almost all three of these areas. So when you're getting started, um, I think it's obvious and quite uh, self-explanatory that you need to obviously have that cause. But when it comes to wanting to build a business, it has to be a very strong cause that you are fully committed towards. It can't be something essentially that you're gonna have second thoughts about or something you're gonna doubt your own uh, passion in. And it, not only that, but it has to be something that I say at least, you can't do without a business, you know? 
Um, the best motivation for wanting to start a business is realizing that if you don't start that, the change you want to make might not be possible. So you want to find a cause that is going to be fully enriched and enhanced by the business. Something that, res that is a need of a large scale and organized um, approach to it. Which is why then when you go up to, to build a business, I think finding those mentors uh, to help you build up a vision and a plan is very important because we'll see later on that a vision and a plan along with your own intentions are going to really be the foundation of a business, no matter what, um, no matter how large it gets and uh, no matter how much it grows, you're really, really going to need to have a strong vision and a strong plan. So getting practical, practical when it comes down to this is really just experience. I can say, especially from these recent months where I've been wanting to start an NGO with a group of friends from MUN Impact, uh, we've really noticed that, especially as a group of youth, um, practice always comes before the structure, uh, especially when you're, when you're younger than most people, you already lack in a lot of credibility. And so if you approach somebody, unless, unless you're on more of a personal level, like their relative, um, it's going to take a lot of experience and a lot of history for them to be able to place their trust in you, especially when it comes to something like funding. So most importantly, you, you're going to always want to get practical. You're always going to want to do the work before you start thinking about maybe organizing it into a systematic way, which is why you don't need an official website. You don't really even need an official name before you start. Um, in fact, uh, you actually need, once again, a complete history, like especially with an NGO. You need a good six months of legitimate experience before you can even think about uh, launching it. And so you really want to make sure that that trajectory that you're, you're establishing is something that's going to set your, your business or your NGO on a really good path for the, for the future. Um, but I think something that is slightly nuanced here is when you're trying to get practical, a lot of people want to find something completely apart, kind of like emailing the person you don't know to try and get some help. Um, people think a lot about, oh, okay, so I have to start doing something completely new that I haven't done. But one of the greatest things to note is that most large businesses that have started, once again, if you ask these people, they're going to say, well, one day I was playing with an Arduino in my garage and I realized that I made something really cool and I had a group of friends that were really interested. And so we decided that we might start uh, competing in a science fair. And from then on, people started asking us to maybe put on little computer shows at their parties and et cetera. So it's something that you're already doing that is going to be most uh, practical, I think. It's, it's thinking about instead of going out and finding the perfect seed to plant so that you can finally build something that will bear more fruits. I think it's about finding the, the little plants that you're already harboring in yourself, those small hobbies that you're, you're really putting a lot of time into that you see potential in to become something more. And it can even be, for example, something you're doing as an after school activity, such as MUN. And you see that there's different aspects of MUN that you can take to a different level, like the SDGs. You could easily start an NGO with that at heart. And, and that's what it's all about. It's, it's already using a platform and a network that you already have, which is why finding a group of friends or, or colleagues or even siblings is the best way to informally begin, you know, uh, your, your business. Begin meeting once or, or twice a month, weekly. It doesn't really matter. It's all about just getting people involved though in, a, in an informal way. Why? Because if you started out as something that you're doing for fun, out of passion, then that's, that's going to be at the heart. That's going to be at the foundation of everything else you do. And when something's based out of heart and passion, uh, it's not just going to run out once money gets there. And, and it's not something that's just going to be exhausted, for example, when you finally hit that point of success. So you want to make sure that the things you start out with are the things that you're going to want to keep in that business uh, forever. And, and, that's why I think above all, it's just the aspect of doing something for fun 
not in that, not in the sense of, okay, I'm just going to do this to do this because I think it's fun, but doing it because you personally just get a lot of fulfillment and enjoyment from it. Um, I myself um, have fallen into the trap of, you know, looking at, for example, what a college may want or what an organization may want and trying to adapt my decisions uh, regarding building a business or an NGO around that. But the truth is, nine out of the 10 people that are successful didn't do it that way. They did it by starting out once again, doing something completely for fun, doing out of uh, just raw passion because they really enjoyed it. Uh, and that evolved into something way bigger because you saw that on a smaller scale, it was successful. And so you start building it up as you go. And a good example of this um, is once again, either MUN or sometimes when it comes to sports, you know, uh, or tutoring, something that, that you slowly get better at as you study and realize maybe you can uh, eventually start an NGO or an after school activity that involves tutoring um, underprivileged students, or maybe even eventually uh, producing uh, certain tutoring textbooks and building a business out of that. But it once again all starts as something uh, much more essential and, and grassroots to what you're doing. So one of the most practical things I, I would recommend is really just finding a group of friends that is going to enjoy doing what you're doing with you. Uh, they're going to provide you with a really, really strong platform for, for essentially growing. And if you think about this as a building, um, the, the friends and the experience are going to be at the bottom. They're the essential part of everything you're doing. So you have to remember to just keep that strong and, and make sure that that's the first thing you bring in. And then of course, you know, people are gonna ask, well, it's a business, so you're obviously gonna need funding and networking. But once you have that experience, that kind of all files in, you know? Uh, I see a lot of uh, successful business people realizing, wow, that child has a lot of passion, not based off of their vision for the future, but based on, off of what they've done. You know, anyone can have a vision. Anyone can say I want to be successful, but it takes true uh, passion and true commitment to be able to say, hey, uh, I've done this already without even having the assurance that I'm going to be successful in the future. So in, in the past few slides, I like to think of it that you've been growing out. You know, you've been expanding so that once again, you have a larger plot to build on. If you think of your business as a literal building, you want to first expand the plot of land before you can build up. Otherwise, you're never gonna, be, you're never gonna have a robust and strong structure. So once you have that foundation and the expansive group of friends that you're, you're working on something with, you can finally start networking. And I think uh, building a network is all about using those tools, your friends, your experience, your projects that you've developed so far to now sustain connections perhaps outside of your close uh, friend group or network. And so that's when it comes to, okay, we're for real now. You, you slap a name on that building so people see, and they slowly see, okay, that building's pretty wide. It, it's getting a bit taller. I might want to have a share in that. And then, of course, funding comes along the way. It's not that simple because you have to do fundraising and all, but I'm not really sure there's practical steps you can give somebody as to how to fundraise if it's not for marketing, you know? Um, you know, create a brand identity, but that all is going to be nothing if you don't have the, the experience. And so what I'm trying to emphasize is the action. So everything you do will truly be, be amplified um, and strengthened then through the practicality of, of the foundation, which is why, you know, it's like you're building and you look at it in this way, the bottom is going to be the foundation that'll stay there forever. And I think it's most importantly something that is going to have your passion and initiative in it. So if you see this, this foundation here, it's not even seen by others a lot of times. Few people know what a business was started for. But when it comes down to it, once people get a lot of money through the business or other such factors, uh, if they don't have a, a more passionate and, and just very committed foundation, things are going to change from then on. And then next, you have those that experience, right? This, this experience, this, this broad band is what really gives your, your business what it's worth. It's the part that people see and say, okay, I want to build off of this. You see this platform? I want to start investing in that. 
And that's when you start using the connections and that comes along the way. These little steel rods here that you see in blue, that's gonna help you grow up. And this analogy, of course, is not something that, that is gonna fuel the success. But if you think about it in this way, in this progressive manner of going from the least, but most important to, to the furthest, it, it'll really help you organize it and approach. And then lastly, the funding and all the little cherry on top, that'll come. Um, but I think when it comes to social causes, uh, that shouldn't be your main point, right? I think your main point should be creating a community that is really, really gonna strive towards achieving something, um, no matter what, whether that you have all the funding or not. Uh, and, and that kind of concludes, right, how you can build a, a business and how you can organize it so that it'll be truly successful and, and it'll be sustainable. Because above all, I think you wanna create a business that isn't just gonna generate money, but that in some way is gonna set an example for other people to either change themselves or to in turn change th those around them. And I think that that's a really, really strong uh, purpose and, that, and that's an impact that everyone wants to have. Because although activism doesn't grow on trees, you can make a tree out of activism and the fruit that that tree is gonna bear is going to be so so strong that it can change the world and you know sometimes it can be the sweetest fruit there but you need to make sure your roots are strong otherwise it'll just fall over on uh, next time a storm comes or or next time something better comes along the way uh so yeah that's how you can really just make an impact and amplify your own personal causes from a, a, something as simple as a an after school activity or a a large business and I think uh, you can start small. I, re I started an after school ac activity um, at another school that I was at. And now I'm working on an NGO and hopefully maybe in the future business and, and it all comes along the way. So yeah, I think we'll open ourselves up to some questions here. Uh, and then if there are no questions, we can give you guys a scenario in which um, we kind of planned out how you can use each of the three approaches to generate a certain uh, environment. So if you guys have any questions, uh, send them away, please. Yep, so um, we got some questions. And so first question by Maria, or Mera, sorry for mispronunciation if I mispronounced it. So the question is how many people don't donate to some NGOs as they don't believe that <clears throat> it's real? How do you get people to believe your NGO and its cause? I think that is actually a really great question because I, we've, I've encountered that with a group of friends as we uh, try and look to start an NGO and it's the experience, you know, once again, anyone can develop, even, even a criminal can develop the best vision and the most appealing set of values. They can say, this is what we're doing, but the best way to show people that you're going to use their money for a good cause is saying, look, in the past month, we've helped out these four communities. We've built up uh, these six um, campaign hospitals or, or anything along those lines. So bring out the experience because that's what you have to show. And that's going to that's gonna prove that you're doing something useful. Yeah. So next question is from Erika. And... Um... The question is, what advice or suggestion do you have for starting an ASA or NGO that supports a cause that is generally rejected by those around you? So for this question, I will reply for it. So um, for ASA, um, although it is rejected, it will differ from your school. When the school re rejected it, it is more likely to seem hard to create ASA. So I will recommend to create an NGO instead by as Anastasia mentioned, um, by asking a help from your family members or like nearby people. Um, for the ASA, when you're IB school, then you can create it with the supervision of another adult. I don't know for AP school, so Tovia, can you take over and explain a bit? Yeah, with um, APs, it'll, it'll be the same system. Nothing will really change. Uh in regard to that, except for maybe some, some personal requirements. Um, and I think I'll just quickly answer the last question we have here, seeing that we're nearly out of time. Uh, and I think that to make your, your organization stand out, it feels like I'm being redundant in saying this, but it's the work, you know, 
Um, it sh I think and the best way is to have a complex set of outcomes. I think um, you want to make your everything you're doing yield more than just either money or yield more than just change. Um, to make yourself stand out, I'd say above all, create sustainability. Um, show others that you're not just changing an a community, show them that you're, you're teaching the community how to change itself and improve itself in the future. Because that's something that is, it's invaluable. If you can teach a group of people, um, instead of just teaching them how to read, but teaching them to teach others how to read, that's gonna, that's gonna make a big, big difference because that's gonna have a long lasting change. Yeah, I think we got the last question ready. Um, the last question, due to time constraint, is what, your, your take on activism on streets? Um, I think that's, it's a great way to, to, to show support in a public manner. And it's a lot of times a great way to gain, gain uh, funding and to show others that you're serious because you're, you're putting your reputation out there, right? And, and you're making sure that you're associated with what's ever going on. So I think that when it comes to making making your intentions uh valid that that's a great way um thank you all for joining our session i hope you all were able to uh, draw out some both general and specific concepts or tips from what we're doing here and i hope you can all uh, be successful in all of your initiatives um, wherever you are and make sure that you plant those trees and, and yield the good fruit thank you very much um thank you everyone for coming Thank you for your questions. Um, and yes, I think that is that was a very interesting um, um, presentation there. And I think we're all going to come out of this having something to um, well, really thinking about how we can um, how we can increase our um, our impact in our communities through activism. Um, so thank you very much, guys, for that. Um, so please do go and check out our 24 hour help desk if you have any questions um, um, it, that will be closing at the end of today once our um, workshops are over. So if you have any final questions about anything to do with MUN Impact or the summit, please do go there. And otherwise, we'd really appreciate it if you gave us some feedback on um, how the summit has gone for you as well. So I've put a link in the chat there for our feedback form. So um, that will really help us improve um, for our next summit. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, presenters, for um, all your work um, towards what was an, a very interesting presentation there. And um, I hope every, everyone enjoys their final day of the summit. Great. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, admins. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.